The body of every living being does not have the same density everywhere. There are river parts, voids, thicker parts, again, voids. The body of every living uh, being does not have a nomomeric nature. There are portions that, are not, that not only have a different shape from others, but seem to be more active than the rest. Even the simple, simplest morphological and physiological unit of our body, the cell, contains this intrinsic variety within itself. Inside us, indeed, in each of our cells, there are some small portions of, matters, of matter that are com comparable to tiny microscopic writers. Thanks to a relatively recent, recent scientific tradition, the term was invented by William Jones in, in 1909. Uh, uh, we call these small writers, or better, copy writers, genes. They are body within the bodies engaged in the drafting, drafting of a code, which from them takes the name of genetic code. They are, they are very particular writers. Unlike what happens to each of us when we are writing, unlike to what happens to me when I wrote this talk, these microscopic writers coincide with what they write and with the writing process itself. They write, but they materially what they write. They are a form of writing that is generated by and that never separates from the body of the writer. As if all the words I wrote would travel with me as an added anatomical part of my body. Or better, genes are copy writers for whom the act of writing coincides with a surgical practice on one's own body that constantly reinvents and reshapes one own, one's own writing. In the sense, the meaning of the writing coincides with what they manage to do with the body. It is a creative form of writing in the very literal sense of the word, as if every word I am writing would change my body forever. Writing is to them an ontological process of metamorphosis. That means at least two or three things. First of all, speaking to say, uh, to, uh, speaking to say I means for them always to replicate, them, replicate themselves. If you are a gene and not a genius, you cannot give any information about you or about the organism you are a part of, but replicating yourself, copying yourself, multiplying yourself. Writing is always a, self, a form of self-copywriting. Information is always a duplication. Secondly, unlike the normal process of writing, what they write has an immediate effect just through physical contact with the rest of the ambient world that surrounds them. Words never need to be represented, imagined, reduced to something immaterial. To speak means to touch things with their own physical body. Thirdly, and most importantly, exactly like in every act of writing, the main goal of the process is to change, to produce something new that didn't already exist. But since there is no difference between the speaker and the spoken words, the subject and the information which is delivered, then the new can emerge only through metamorphosis. To write means for a gene to undergo to a process of duplication and change. That is what scientists call meiosis, and that is the condition of possibility of sex. My first point, and I beg your pardon if I'm introducing technical, highly sophisticated biological concepts in this extremely imprecise and ridiculous way, would be that sex is just a condition of possibility of the writing of life, or better, as life as a writing activity. Only because of sex, we can speak about gene as information, as a code, as a linguistic or semantic machinery. Otherwise, genetics would be another form of preformationism, only because the identity of the individual is broken into parts, and those parts are distributed to different writers, the genes, living beings can be considered as if they were a form or the most basic form of language. Sex, from this point of view, is a particular technique 
that allows those writers suddenly to exchange parts of the body, that is information, with other writers of the same or of another individual of the same species. Sex is the most sophisticated art of writing, the one which allows to say I or me through others, the one who allows living bodies to change their identity. It is the principal and most common technique of self-metamorphosis of living beings. Then only through sex, only through this metamorphosis, the microcopy writers who are writing our destiny uh, 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 transform life in something different from the pure repetition of the same. Sex, in other words, is what makes out of life, out of this act of writing, something which can have and actually has a meaning. It is the semantic which gives to the material syntactic reality of our body the possibility to say something different from, this, uh, from the simple word me. Out of the writing metaphor, sex, as we all, knows, uh, all know, does not coincide with reproduction. It is the process that allows to make out of life an engine for the production of variation and novelty. That is, differences. What we call sex is just a common name for the process of self-differentiation of the living being. From this point of view, sex is much more radical and deeper than identity no matter if it's the specific or the in individual kind of identity. Specific identity and un individuality are not transcendental dimensions, dimension of the living being, but attitudes that life has invented in order to better spread itself. They are historical, accidental, transient attitudes that thanks to sex process are standing in the way of reconfiguration. Because of our sexual nature, we, are always, uh, we always are something before or beyond our humanity or our individuality. Thanks to sex, our relationship to other species or other individualities is just the relationship that words can have to the writing process. They can become part of the same sentence. Out of the metaphor, we can materially become other individuals or other species and we are the metamorphosis of other individuals and other species. This is the first teaching of my talk. We should again learn to consider sex not as something through which we acquire an identity, no matter if it's a bi biological one, a cultural one, a performative one, a specific one, a gender identity, but a sort of pragmatic and an ontological threshold through which we have to lose to abandon our identity. Because of sex, we are constantly obliged to rewrite, to copy differently ourselves, to change identity. Because of our sexual nature, we will never be the same. Since Darwin, biology has proved that there is a genetic and genealogical relationship between all living beings. There is a common origin of the living beings reproduction as the place where all species have woven a, a reciprocal relationship. And it is precisely out of this genealogical interconnection that life has generated and invented. This genealogical bond between species and individuals is perpetually overcome and renegotiated in the act of sex. We share the same DNA, the same genetic structures, but the same structure, the same army of writers never stop to change the body, never stop changing the places, never stop changing the letters. Sex is nothing than the, this daily construction and, and deconstruction of a common language to all living beings beyond individuality and identity, a writing which circulates not only from place to place, but from body to body, from individual to individual, from species to species, from kingdom to kingdom, through sex, genes of writing a huge interspecific novel, a sort of written Leviathan. However, unlike the classical Leviathan, this multi-species Leviathan is produced, is produced not by a definitive contract, by a stable form of language, but by changing constantly the words, by constantly reformulating the contract, paraphrasing the formulas letter after letters. That is the Leviathan, um, 
is changing every time its face. And above all, it is not given at once, once for all. It must be built and written day after day, sexual act after sexual act. Now, what can plants specifically t teach us about the nature of and the experience of sex? And on the contrary, what can sex, that is this technique of self-metamorphosis, self teach us about the nature of plants? First of all, if we love plants, that is, um, that is if we have relationships with plants which overcome the utility relationship that we can have with them in agriculture, because of the fact that they give us food, in engineering, because of the fact that they give us wood, and in pharmacology, because of the fact that they give us medications and remedies, it is because of flowers. Now, flowers are the sexual organs of plants. That is, we love plants, we let them enter and shape our sexual, uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, our cultural, spiritual world because of their sexual, sexuated, sexy body. We consider plants above all because we all know that they can teach us something about sex, as if plants would live sex in the mass radical way, as if in plants sex would be the unique entire content and form of a life. Plant sex, we love plants because we love sex when it is able to shape our life. Now, the first element to mention about flowers, the first element to mention about the vegetal experience of sex is the fact that, properly speaking, they are not organs. They are not permanent, specialized structures which are always there in order to make the encounter with the other possible. The, the flowers are topped up structures modified from other organs to make sex possible. Uh, they are also ephemeral, temporary, unstable structures. Imagine to have sex, uh, that to have sex, uh, you have to transform each time a part of your leg, a part of the belly. Or imagine that uh, in order to have sex, you have to build from nothing every time your penises or your vaginas. Imagine to have sexual organs that are structured like your hair or your nails or even walls, like a pimple, a faruncle or a boil. That is something that grows independently from you and that falls away when you have used it. Imagine that the existence of your penis or your vagina is seasonal, linked to the outside atmosphere. Imagine what we what it would mean for us to have to build new sexual organs each time that we want to have sex without being assured of their permanence. So this is actually how plants live sex through flowers. So the first teaching of plant sex is the fact that sex has to imply the constant refashioning and rebuilding of our body. If plants are sexualized and sexuated bodies and beings, it is because, uh, in a way, they generalize this peculiar way of being of their sexual organs and of sex to their entire body, to their entire existence. Plants are beings that coincide, uh, which coincide with sex because they are constantly have to rewrite differently their bodily identity. They are constantly reshaping their own anatomy. Flowers, in this sense, are just the quintessence of this special anatomical feature, the impossibility of stopping growth, the impossibility of moving toward a state different from that a work in progress or being under construction. Just think about the tree. It, it, doesn't, it cannot just stop growing or reshaping itself. It just keeps uh, refashioning its own body every season and season after season. The reason of this very weird, sexy kind of body, bodily organization is the presence of meristematic cells, cells that are constantly existing in a status of totipotency and can become whatever kind of tissue and organs it needs. Because of them, in plants it is possible to distinguish and divide 
the phase of self-constructing body, the growth, and the phase of reproducing oneself, as must animals do. To be a plant, as we could, and we could say to be sexy, to be constantly under the influence of sex, means that you are constantly producing and redesigning your body. Now, if it's impossible to distinguish between reproduction and growth, then it is not possible to be distinguished between artificiality and naturalness. The body is never purely natural, it is always constructed. On the contrary, the construction, the production, loses its artificial character since it never exceeds the boundaries of the individual body. To live as a plant always means to build and rebuild oneself. Uh, one could say that plants' life a sexy life is a constant and insensate act of self-design. Being itself is design, that is sex, not form but production of forms. In a life where being is design, the body is always to build, it is not something given but a somatic do-it-yourself act. Life as an, an, as, as an insensate act of somatic DIY that's a plant, and that's sex. Life as design, this is to live sex as your most important and general dimension. There is a second teaching that plants could give us about sex. Flowers still embodying give to see another typical character of plants, uh, of plants' life, sorry. Sexual life is not a private and intimate event between two individuals of the same species and of a different gender but a sort of public, interspecific gathering. Sex is the first place where species meets, and not only because uh, it is one of the main sources of a specific evolution. One could say that plants preferred, in the past, sex to consciousness. That's because they invented flowers and not consciousness. So, indeed, the flowers appear as the opposite, the exact opposite of consciousness. Consciousness is an instrument of interiorization of the world. It miniaturizes, so to speak, what goes on outside in order to control it, to allow decision, to become the, it is the instrument of taking power over space and especially over the future. A flower, on the contrary, is the construction of a trompe l'oeil space, a poor appearance that does not serve to internalize the surrounding world not to master it, but to produce a pure surface of conjunction. There is in a flower a sort of radical exposure to the exterior world, to chance, to the decision of others. In, in flowers, indeed, the act of sex ceases to be an instrument of, at the service of the individual or specific narcissism to become ecology of the condensation F of mixture. Because of flowers, the relationship between individuals of the same species is mediated by the relationship with other individuals of different genera or species, but also kingdoms. What I'm saying, I uh, try to explain it. As you know, much flowers make self-fertilization impossible. Precisely for this, there is a fertility, uh, because of the fact that the, the, the flowers are a uh, sessile being, it is necessary uh, that someone take the pollen elsewhere. Uh, this someone or this something can be wind, rain, but very often they are animals, insects for instance. Imagine that you need an elephant uh, for a spermatozoon to meet an egg. Or even better, imagine that you need a tree or any individual belonging to another country, kingdom. This is sex for plants. A sort of cosmic appointment in which for a single plant individual to reproduce, the, wo the whole biological space-time is folded to create a strange universal orgy. Sex becomes not a private fact, but a kind of landscape, an ecology. Here we have a second lesson. Sex is what gives to the relationship of beings the form of a common shared ecology, a landscape, an horizon.
This is how we must learn to live sex following plants. Have sex means to learn how to get a new relationship with other species, even the one who belong to other kingdoms. Sex is not and should not be the event that allows us to get an intimate relationship with a human being of the same or of a different gender. Sex has to be the way we get in touch with all kinds of different beings. And this is the second aspect. This contact should not and have not to be a poor relational and knowledge relationship, a, a relational nature and knowledge relationship. Sex is the relationship, for plants at least, where each of the individuals take part uh, of the identity of the other. Sex should be the relationship where um, or the relationship we build with other species in order to change our anatomical identity, our genetic destiny. Uh, um, what I mean, again, um, I try to redescribe what is happening in a simple act, act of pollination, actually. Uh, uh, in pollination, we have this uh, very simple fact that the encounter with the other is always and necessarily a union with uh, the world in its diversity of forms and substances. To have sex with another flower, in a way, a plant, or with another plant, with another individual, a plant must, uh, in a way, have a contact, a physical contact with insects, wind, water, animals of this uh, different uh, sex. And this cosmic or justic opening to individuals of other realms and kingdoms, it is not only a matter of simple multiplication of identities, it is not just a multi-species salon. In sex, uh, the relationship that the individual has with itself is not only open and mediated by the necessary relationship that one must have with uh, spe other species or other kingdoms. Um, the most important thing is that the flowers transform this relationship into something which has a technical nature. In fact, uh, uh, the, in the opening, the other, the insect for instance, is not simply the sexual partner or the helper. It is someone who becomes a kind of farmer or a breeder. The sex in plants turns other species and other individuals into farmers, into something that can change the genetic destiny of the others. Uh, in, that's the reason why flowers have these uh, very, very strange uh, forms. Uh, the forms that, that allows to put the destiny, the sexual and evolution and, and the genetic destiny of the indeed individuals in the hands and lives of others. Above all, the flower steers in a very particular way the relationship of the individual to the surrounding world, uh, or to put it better, to the surrounding species, there, it, there is what we could call a sort of inverted agriculture or inverted husbandry, an opening in which other species become farmers or geneticists, breeders, deciding who gets involved with whom, who is mating with whom, and so on. Plant sex tell us that in a way, agriculture is a form of sex by interposed species. Every time that we are meeting people from other species, we are participating to a sex event. Every time that we offer flowers, we are too transforming plants into our ag agricultural breeders. Every time that we are drinking wine in order to have better sex, we are also transforming plants in our breeders and we are having sex like plants have sex. In this sense, a flower a flower is a reversal of the idea of the sexual selection in Darwin's sense, and the, uh, the reversal also of the idea of natural selection in, in general. Sex is not the place of the judgment of one gender on the other. There is no intergender selection. There is no sexual competition. Other living beings decides for you. Other living beings belong to other kingdoms. 
Sex is the threshold where your identity depends from other living beings, from other species. Sex is the decision about our identity mediated by other kingdoms. If plow, from this point of view, I'm just uh, concluding, sorry. From this point of view, also the idea of, na of a natural selection become, becomes too reductive. If, plow, if flowers put the pollinator, the insect, in the same position as the farmer, then there is uh, not true anymore. it is not true anymore that there is something like a universal force which selects the evolution of the species through competition. On the contrary, because of this ecological, sexual relationship between all species, selection is always operated in a sexuated way by other species belonging to other kingdoms, or by wind or by rain. Nature is nothing more than a huge interspecific orgy, a cosmic interbreeding where every species delegates to other species its own evolutionary fate. Through plants, through a life entirely determined by sex, the world is the space where all species of all the world produce a sort of purely relational reality where each species is the pollinator of the other. Every being is the gardener or the bee of the other species and a garden or the flower for still others. And what we call world is only this perpetual invasion of a multi-specific sexual relation. We could not stop to have sex. We could not stop to be sexy for thousand other species. Thank you.